Welcome back to the next lecture, everybody. In this one, we are going to cover splenic injury, hepatic injury, pulmonary contusions, and blunt cardiac injury. Let's first dive in and start with splenic injury. Now, the spleen can be injured in both blunt trauma and penetrative trauma, and it's going to present with several findings. Now, most commonly, if you've got a, a patient who is conscious, they may experience what is known as a curse sign. This is pain in the left shoulder that's made worse upon inspiration. They may also experience pain at baseline in either, the, in either the left upper abdominal area, the left shoulder, or the left chest wall. And this left-sided shoulder pain is a type of refer referred pain, and that's caused by blood irritating the phrenic nerve. Now, imaging consistent with splenic injury on a FAST exam includes subscapular fluid in the spleen that's represented by a hypoechoic space, which is surrounding the organ. Fluid can also be identified in the hepatorenal space, which is commonly referred to as Morrison's pouch, as well as free intraperitoneal fluid, which would typically be located in close, prox in close proximity to the spleen. Now, those are the ultrasound findings. If we look at CT findings, it might show fluid in the peritoneum near the spleen, which is a sign of probable splenic bleeding, and extravasation of contrast from the spleen indicates an active brisk bleed that requires surgical management. Areas of the spleen that are hypodense may also be present, and this indicates the presence of a possible intraparenchymal or subcapsular hematoma, or a general disruption of the splenic parenchyma. Now, treatment for splenic injury really depends on a variety of factors, most critically the hemodynamic status of the patient. Now, as with all trauma, the patient will first be assessed via the primary and, when appropriate, the secondary survey, so you want to make sure you review those components from the trauma lecture if you haven't done so yet. All hemodynamically unstable patients who have a splenic injury identified as a likely cause of hemorrhage based on imaging will require immediate splenectomy. Hemodynamically stable patients who cannot tolerate rebleeding will also require immediate splenectomy, as well as those with multiple abdominal organ injuries, including the spleen, resulting in persistent bleeding. Only hemodynamically stable patients who can tolerate rebleeding and have a low grade splenic injury can be managed with serial abdominal exams serial labs to monitor for continued hemorrhage, and angiographic embolization if needed. This would exclude things like a completely shattered spleen or over a quarter of the spleen being devascularized due to the injury. These, this degree of, of severe injury would also need to be surgically managed, even if the patient is hemodynamically stable. Now, patients who fail non-operative management or who fail angiographic embolization will need a splenectomy. Next, we have the hepatic injuries. Now, hepatic injury also often results from blunt or penetrating trauma, and patients will often present with right upper abdominal pain, right shoulder pain, and or right chest wall pain. Now, blood can cause diaphragmatic irritation. That's what causes that referred pain to your right shoulder. Now, patients may also have peritoneal signs in this scenario, and on fast exam, signs of liver injury are similar to the signs of splenic injury, only now it is the liver with the abnormalities. So once again, a hypoechoic space surrounding the liver can be a sign of subcapsular fluid. Now, fluid can also be identified in the hepatorenal space, which is commonly referred to as Morrison's pouch, as well as free intraperitoneal fluid, which will typically be located in close proximity to the liver. Now, if you do a CT scan and it shows IV contrast concentrating in or around the liver, that indicates an ongoing bleed. As far as treatment goes, just as with the spleen, Surgical intervention with liver injury depends on the patient's hemodynamic stability, the presence of other organ injuries, and the severity of the liver injury. Now, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, they can be treated with supportive care and observation. Now, this will be effective in the majority of cases. If observation alone fails, hepatic embolization has a very high success rate and can prevent the need for any further operative management. If you've got a patient who is hemodynamically unstable, they would require immediate exploratory laparotomy as well as hemorrhage control. Now, the progression of interventions is going to increase in a stepwise fashion, with initial management including um, manual compression of the liver between two hands, followed by the packing and clamping of vessels, and then if this is not adequately controlling the bleed, topical hemostatic medications, ligation of intraparenchymal vessels, and or direct liver suturing all would need to be performed. Now, in high-grade injuries, hepatic artery ligation may be required, as well as possible hep hepatectomy, and then, of course, liver transplant. 
Next up is the pulmonary contusion. This usually results from blunt chest trauma. Now, patients will typically present here with chest pain, dyspnea, cough, as well as wheezing or rails. More rarely, uh, pulmonary contusion will also present with hemoptysis. Now, the injury here manifests several hours, up to 24 hours after the trauma, and it actually heals rapidly, typically uh, most cases between 7 to 10 days. Now, on chest radiography, Findings consistent with pulmonary contusions include a regular consolidation and non-lobular patchy opacification of the parenchyma. Treatment includes maintaining the patient in a euvolemic state, providing adequate pain control, uh, as well as providing pulmonary hygiene, which includes performing breathing techniques, spirometry, and suction to help clear the lungs. All right, last up, let's take a look at blunt cardiac injury. Now, there's a number of ways that blunt trauma in the heart can manifest. The first would be, of course, cardiac dysfunction. This encompasses a wide variety of functional impairment, including decreased contractility, decreased stroke volume. That can result, of course, in diminished mean arterial pressure. Now, patients with trauma and hypotension should always be suspected of having hypovolemia from blood loss and should not, always, and should not be assumed to have cardiac dysfunction as the cause of their hypotension. Now, the same can be said of tachycardia in a case of blunt cardiac injury. Prior to suspecting an arrhythmia, you first want to assume that a hemorrhage is causing the tachycardia. Now, after evaluating for hemorrhage, arrhythmias can be further investigated with cardiac monitoring. So uh, arrhythmias associated with blunt cardiac injury are extremely variable. You might see things from AFib to premature ventricular contractions to ventricular fibrillations. Now, less than 5% of patients who experience blunt cardiac trauma will develop an arrhythmia. And usually the arrhythmia, if one does develop, is non-life-threatening. Septal and valvular injuries are also quite rare. Now, septal injuries can vary from a small tear to being totally ruptured. That would, of course, cause heart failure. Valvular injury can result from injury to the papillary muscle or chordae tendinae or from tears to the leaflets themselves. These injuries can cause the affected valve to be insufficient with signs of heart failure. Now, myocardial infarction can also result. That could be due to injury to the coronary arteries during the trauma, uh, via thrombosis, dissection, or laceration of the coronary arteries. These are all possible potential causes. Now, finally, chamber rupture is very likely to result in death prior to arrival to the hospital. That would just be the result of profound hypotension. Now, as far as the workup goes, as I mentioned earlier, the first step in working up patients with suspicion with a suspected blunt cardiac injury, it's going to be to stabilize the patient and rule out hemorrhage as the cause of hypotension. This is the case far more frequently than myocardial contusion, and so only after rigorous fluid resuscitation and ruling out sources of bleeding is this diagnosis of myocardial contusion worked up. An ECG can help us to identify any arrhythmias, can help us to identify bundle branch blocks or signs of MI. A more in-depth echocardiogram than the one we use during the FAST exam to rule out tamponade can be performed if the patient has ECG abnormalities present. Now, those with signs of MI on ECG will have troponin levels measured as well. So you can see, once we figure out what's going on, we sort of follow typical protocol that we went through in all the um, internal medicine lectures. Now, management for blunt cardiac injury really is going to depend on the specific complications that arise. Generally, all these pathologies are going to be managed in the same manner as non-traumatic causes, with the exception of an MI, where thrombolytics are typically avoided due to the risk of catastrophic hemorrhage. Instead, patients undergo catheterization with stenting or coronary artery bypass surgery. Arrhythmias, of course, are managed depending on the specific rhythm present. Septal injury and valvular injury that leads to heart failure will be treated with surgical correction. And then a chamber rupture would be treated with repair if we, in fact, get to the patient before they die. All right, next, uh, content review. All right, let's do some content review questions. I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. The 
correct answer here is D. Last question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it, come on back. Correct answer here is A. All right, guys, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you on the next one.